Welcome to our talk about CGI bin, uh, <laughs> which is uh, definitely <laughs> a really new <laughs> technology. Um, it makes developing web applications really simple. All you have to do is drop a, a really simple Perl script, script into a certain directory called CGI bin on your web server, and, and that's it. Uh, it's deployed, and you can just run it from whatever path it's at. So uh, unfortunately, our talk is not exactly about CGI bin. It's about functions as a service. Uh, which is definitely a new technology uh, for Kubernetes. Um, this talk is about fission. Um, so, so on a more serious note, it, it's been more than two decades since CGI have been, and we've, we've lost that simplicity that it had. Um, so today you have this long series of steps, build a container, push it to a registry, um, figure out your Kubernetes configuration, make sure your cluster is set up correctly, and then repeat some of these steps every time your, your app changes, rebuild the container, push it, figure out how your versions run. Um, so th this is not to say that this new world is terrible. We've gained a lot. We've gained the ability to have homogeneous deployments using containers. We've gained really powerful orthogonal distributed systems primitives with Kubernetes. Um, but we've made it really hard to get started in this world. So, so what we're really trying to do is get to a point where we can have the power of containers and Kubernetes, but make it much simpler also. So hold that thought. I'm going to switch topics a little bit to resource utilization, um, specifically CPU and memory. So we're, we're uh, going towards this world where we have divided our solutions, our applications, into a lot of tiny pieces. And many of those pieces are very rarely used, especially if they're driven by events that occur fairly rarely. So, so once you have enough of those services, your cluster capacity has to account for all of the services that you've deployed and are idle, and also for the services that, you, uh, that are actually loaded, which are, the ones that you, which are the only ones that you really would like to pay for. So ideally, the services that are idle should be free. So what if we could solve both these problems? What if we could have containers and the power of containers and Kubernetes, but really simple dev workflows? Um, and what if we could have our cluster capacities be more directly proportional to our, to our actual usage? Um, and the answer to that, the, the answer to both of those things is functions as a service. Um, it's one of the really good answers to both of these questions. Um, and to focus on one of the points in functions as a service is that if you want services to be free when they're idle, and if you also want them to have good performance, especially latency, when uh, when they do get a bunch of requests, then you need to make sure that you go from no instances to enough instances really quickly when your traffic does come in. So this brings us to Fission. Fission is a functions as a service for Kubernetes. Uh, the user, you write short-lived short stateless functions. You define them declaratively and at the source level. We'll talk much more about that. And uh, they are free when idle. You only pay for the storage of those functions. Uh, they consume CPU and memory only when they're running and they start quickly on demand. So as a user, you have only three concepts to learn in Fission, functions, environments, and triggers. Uh, functions, more properly, they're modules, um, but the entry point is a function. The function runs inside an environment. So an environment in Fission is all of the language-specific stuff that, uh, that's in a, uh, all of the language-specific stuff of Fission is in environment. So you have Node.js, Python containers, and so on. Um, and uh, an environment is a container which loads a function dynamically. And a trigger is a mapping of an event to a function call. So HTTP triggers map, uh, HTTP requests to function calls, there are message queue triggers, and so on. Um, so there's a whole bunch of triggers and environments supported, Node.js, Python, Go, um, the synchronous HTTP, uh, two or three message queues, um, and Kubernetes watches, timers, and so on. Uh, more complete lists on the website. Uh, so let's get a little bit into how Fission executes functions. Um, and this is one of the ways Fission executes functions, but it's a more interesting way, so we'll, we'll talk a, a little more about this. Um, fundamentally, the way to get fast cold starts is by having a pre-warmed pool of something. And uh, since Fission runs on Kubernetes, it has a pre-warmed pool of containers running in pods. And um, so there's a Fission client, and uh, Fission resources are stored as Kubernetes custom resources. Um, so the client, let's, uh, let's denote functions as these colorful circles, and the client uploads these functions into the Kubernetes API. I'm oversimplifying a little bit. Um, 
And the fission pool manager notices that these functions ha have been created on the Kubernetes API. Uh, it figures out what environments these functions are running, so these functions need. So if there's a Node.js and a Python function, it creates pools of Node and Python containers. Um, and let's focus on HTTP requests. So if there's an HTTP request, uh, it comes into the router. And let's say it's a blue request for that blue function. Then the, let's say it's the first time this function has run. So now that request is waiting, and we need to create an instance, uh, a running instance of this function while that request is waiting. So this is a cold start. Um, so what we need to do is the router makes a request to the pool manager, which draws a already running pod from that pool, it uh, loads that function into that pod, and it hands over the address of that pod to the router, which then proxies that request into the pod. Um, similarly, as more requests come in, uh, the, the same process repeats. Uh, this cold start process takes uh, on the order of 100 or so milliseconds, give or take. Um, those pods are cached as uh, uh, for a while, even if there are no more requests for a few minutes, so that subsequent requests can hold on, uh, subsequent requests can reuse those pods. Um, and if there are no more requests, if a function is idle for several minutes, uh, those pods are killed, and you regain that uh, CPU and memory that they were using. So the function is free again. Um, so let's look at how this actually works. I'm gonna switch my display so I can actually see that screen. Uh, okay. That's way too small. People in the back, can you read? Yes? No? Anyone? Yes? All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, so I can look at my own screen. All right. Okay, so this is a, damn it, sorry. That's my other demo. So this is a Kubernetes cluster deployed on GKE with Fission installed. Okay, we're connected to the cluster. There are those nodes. Uh, you can just see the Fission deployment. Uh, it's not super important what those pods are. Um, we'll run a really simple hello world function. And we'll create an environment for that function. And on this demo cluster, it was already created. Uh, but all you have to do is specify that Node.js environment that Fission ships with. Um, and here we're just looking at the pool that got created. So all of those containers, all of those pods are idle. Um, you can tune how many there are, but in this case there are three. And we create the Fission function. Uh, this, this function is, is now uploaded to Fission. It's stored as a Kubernetes custom resource, but it's not executing yet. Uh, there's no runtime resources allocated to it just yet. Um, then we set up an HTTP trigger for this function, also called a route, and we actually hit that route with curl. And let's see. So here you can see it took, so we ran curl three times on that hello world function. It, uh, first of all, it actually worked and we got hello world. Uh, secondly, you can see that the first one was a little bit slower than the subsequent invocations. Um, the first one took 290 milliseconds, that's 90 milliseconds, and that's about 100. So there's something between 100 and 200 uh, milliseconds of overhead uh, in the cold start. And that part is cached, and you can find it with your usual Kubernetes uh, commands. The part is labeled with the function, so if you have any monitoring tools that, uh, that use labels, you can keep using them, okay? Uh, so that's, so that's hello world. I'm gonna switch back a little bit to our slides and talk about specifying an application. So, so we saw that this, this demo creates, uh, creates your function using the command line, uh, which is great for starting out and experimenting, but how do you deal with, uh, how do you do that in production? Uh, where do you save that command line? Do you write a script and check it in? That sounds kind of horrible. Um, so ideally, you'd have some sort of declarative specification, and you check it into source control. Um, and that's great for doing, uh, for doing updates, for having item potent behavior. And I, what we really want is both. We, we want command lines to get started and declarative specifications so that we can check them in and have ongoing maintenance. 
And we can do both of these things by doing something what, that we call config by example. So what, what we want to do is say, create this function, but save what you're doing in some sort of declarative spec so that you can then apply that spec to another cluster. OK? So let's switch back to, let's switch back to, oh, all right, let's try this. OK. Uh, Hopefully, people in the back can read this. OK, so let's take a simple Python function. And it's over there. Um, I'm actually going to full screen that. And now what we've done is we've done the same function create command that you saw earlier, except that we've saved what it did in a specification. Right? And that specification is saved in a specs directory at the root of your application. Um, and there's a lot more in that YAML, but this is basically a Kubernetes custom resource. Um, you, you don't ever have to write this YAML from scratch. You can just create them using these command lines. Okay? And then you can just apply this spec. You can check that YAML in, and you can apply it to the same cluster, to any other cluster. And so that function is now created, and we can run that test. Uh, let's OK, so that's actually run. Now, what we'd also like to do is have a really nice and fast code, edit, test, debug, change the code cycle, right? You're especially in a developer workflow. So what we can do is, since we have a declarative specification, we can get Fission, the Fission client to watch your file system. And every time you change the file to rebuild the function, upload it, and deploy it. Um, and this is basically to make your dev workflows really easy and fast. Right? So let's save that. And the Fission CLI says, OK, I noticed a file change. I'm going to apply the spec again. And now if we just reload this, we see it's deployed. OK, so you have a feedback loop that works on the order of milliseconds instead of a really long time. We didn't rebuild any containers here. Your code was just deployed in the cluster. Now, this is great for a dev uh, workflow. Uh, but what you can do is you can uh, pull out the, the file. You can, once you qualify your file and um, you're satisfied with the testing, you can then save that file and uh, check in your specifications, and use them in production. Uh, and everyone on your team can have an easy development workflow using this, uh, this kind of thing. So, um, so this is Python, um, which, in which it's fairly easy to do these things because it's an interpreted language, so, so we don't have to build it. Um, but what about things like Go, right? So with Go, we need we need to build the function, and we can do that too in Fission, uh, and we can also do it declaratively. So here I have a, a Go Hello World application. The specs have already been created using the same way, and I'm going to do the same apply watch thing. And uh, oops. So that one was already there. But let's do the same thing, and uh, OK, so we save it. Um, and now Fission needs to build that. So it just builds it. Uh, uh, the, the, the pattern is, again, declarative, de uh, declarative. So the source code is uploaded, and a build controller watches that package, notices that the source code uh, runs the Go compiler. Uh, nothing needs to be installed on your, on your local machine. All of the actual compile happens on the cluster itself. Um, and you can reload that, and that works too. All right. Uh, so you can keep watching this. You can keep making changes. Uh, 
Uh, it takes a few seconds for the Go builder to run. You can do that. All right. OK. So, so this is great for, for So we talked a bit about development workflows. I'm going to switch to things that you care about at runtime. Jeez. OK, so things that you care about at runtime. Um, two of the things that you care about are, are observability, and, and we'll talk about auto-scaling as well. Uh, if you were at, uh, at Ben Sigelman's keynote yesterday, you saw how uh, Modern outages are kind of like murder mysteries because there's so many interacting components. Uh, and so, and if you think about it, functions as a service makes those murder mysteries even worse because now you have 10 times as many interacting components. So observability becomes really important when you have a lot of interacting functions. Uh, so like everyone else, we're really excited about Istio. And we've integrated Fission with Istio so that your function pods have the Istio sidecar uh, have Envoy, and they report into, uh, it reports data into Prometheus, Grafana, and so on. So let me find that. Oh, crap. I seem to have lost my Istio demo. Well, let's just run it. So we have just a hello world function in Node.js on this cluster, and we have Istio deployed as well. So you can see, you've got a little minus n Istio system. So Istio is deployed here, and when we actually test the function, it runs. Okay, pretend that didn't happen. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is a hello world function. For those who can't see it at the back, here it is again. Um, and that shows up on both uh, Prometheus and Open Tracing, uh, the Jaeger dashboards that Istio creates for us. Uh, okay, so now let's actually generate a little bit of load and see that, see how that shows up in our. Uh, in our dashboards. Uh, this is the function uh, being loaded. Uh, hey is a simple load generator. What we're doing here is uh, sending it uh, 2,000 requests with, let's send it 200, uh, with a concurrency of 20. So 20 requests uh, simultaneously going on. And that was the little test request we did earlier. So we should ideally see these, uh, this graph go up in a, in a moment. And this is the usual Prometheus dashboard that Istio creates. Meanwhile, oh, okay, here it is. It's doing, it'll eventually go to 20, I think. Oh, it actually finished. We can do some more. All right, and similarly, we get tracing. So, Let's pick an arbitrary trace and look at it. And we can see here that uh, this trace is pretty simple. There's just two spans. Um, this is the fission. The first one up there, you probably can't read it, is, uh, is the fission router. And the lower one is the actual fission function, which just does hello world. Uh, in this case, the router took 30 something milliseconds, and the actual function took 28 milliseconds. So this might have been the cold start. This is a slightly more representative trace. Not really. I'm not sure why. Anyway, um, this trace actually shows you the overhead of the router, which in this case is of single digit milliseconds. In this case, it's two and a half milliseconds, which is on the high side, um, but at least you have some visibility into your system. And we can talk a little bit later about what we're trying to do about the overheads of our router. All right. Um, so that's, that's observability using the STO service mesh. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, 
having more traffic on functions. Uh, so the execution method that I showed you earlier is great for having really low latency for loading a function into a pod and being able to send it a request, uh, but it's not great for having, uh, for systems that have high throughput, um, but may or may not care about latency. For those systems, you need something like the Kubernetes horizontal pod autoscaler. Um, and I'm gonna demo that in a, in a video because the actual autoscaler takes uh, a few minutes to actually, uh, to actually notice things. So this is a speeded up video of the autoscaler running. Uh, so, so fission function, the fission environment is created um, and we allow you to specify min and max uh, CPU and memory. These are defaults for functions created in that environment. The environment, the, the function can override it. Um, so we're creating a function and we define um, a min and max scale. We pointed at that environment. We define a min and max scale of one and um, six. And we specify that we want to use a new, the, the separate deployment backend, uh, which will also create a horizontal part autoscaler. Um, next, we create an HTTP trigger for that function so we can generate some load and point at it. Um, we do a simple request on it to make sure it works. Um, so that's, again, a simple hello world function. We've, we've artificially uh, kept that, um, we've artificially kept the, the maximum CPU really low so that hello world will actually auto scale. Otherwise, you would, you would be fine with a, a very small number of instances. Uh, you can see that Fission created a horizontal part auto scaler for that function automatically. Um, and again, we've, we've set the target a bit low for, for this demo, but you can set the target to something more realistic like 80, 90%. Uh, and it set a min and max scale that you had provided at the, at the function level. And currently, there's just one replica. So again, we start our load generator with a concurrency of 250, and we send it to that same URL. And what we're looking for is that CPU to go up and the pod autoscaler to catch up and create more replicas. So it does so pretty quickly. Again, this video is sped up about 2x. Um, yeah, 2x, I think. So, so you quickly reach three replicas. Uh, the, the CPU usage is still pretty high. Uh, once the actual load generator finishes, the CPU usage comes way back down. And the pod autoscaler uh, notices that. And it actually has a... Um, and I, uh, a scale downtime of several minutes, which is why this is a video. Uh, but five or six minutes after your load stops, the autoscaler brings your instances back down to, uh, to the minimum scale that you had set up with the function. So this is function autoscaling. Um, and there's work going on to, to combine both these backends so that you can have uh, low latency for the startup as well as high throughput uh, when you have a lot of load. All right, so... That's auto scaling. We go back to our slides for a bit. And um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, larger applications of, that contain interacting functions. So there's a lot of different ways that you can have your functions interact. Uh, you can just do plain old HTTP requests from between functions. Um, and because of the Istio integration, you'll have some measure of observability into those. Uh, you'll have some insight into, into how those requests are going. But it would be pretty cool if that entire um, interaction between functions were abstracted away in some way. So we've created a system called Fission Workflows, where you can create some sort of flowchart, in some sense, of functions. And the workflow engine will, uh, will coordinate those functions. It will manage both data and control flow. And, um, and you'll actually be able to, to have functions talk to each other without calling each other explicitly using a, using a separate workflow that, that operates on them. So I'm going to switch back to a demo. Uh, I'm talking mostly demos. Let's see if I can find my... Okay. So again, I'm going to show a really trivial workflow here. Uh, we're going to run the, the Unix fortune command as a function. And it, um, I don't know, it, it outputs some sort of random quote. 
And we have this function, which outputs uh, an ASCII art cartoon whale that, uh, that contains a speech bubble containing whatever it, uh, whatever it sent. Okay, so now we're gonna create a workflow that combines these two functions without actually having the first function call the other. And we do that by defining a, uh, a workflow in YAML, and it's got tasks, and each task is a fission function call. Let me make that a bit bigger. And the first one is the generate fortune task, which calls fortune. And the second one is the whale with fortune, so it calls whale say with the input of that first task. So the input here, that's the data flow, and there's a requires, which makes sure that the generate runs before this task, and that's the control flow. So you can define dependencies this way. Uh, this is a really simple workflow with two tasks, but if you had more tasks, you could, uh, you have implicit parallelism. Parallelism. And hopefully we should see a, a whale saying something silly eventually. All right. The code is entirely random. Okay, so the first function was run, the workflow engine uh, interpreted the YAML and, uh, and allowed you to, allow those functions to just have the, the data sent from one function to another. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of time to dive into how the workflow engine works, uh, but essentially it uses a message queue to, be, to have uh, persistent uh, uh, events tracked as the workflow executes. So as each task finishes, it's tracked in a message queue, and that triggers the workflow engine again to, uh, to invoke the next function. And uh, that's also how uh, concurrency works. So if you have a, a task that depends on uh, a bunch of different tasks and they don't have any dependencies between them, uh, then all those tasks could run in parallel. And again, you would do this without explicitly having any kind of um, uh, explicit parallelism in the workflow. Okay, so I've run through my demos, and so a little bit about the status of the project. Um, Fission Core actually open sourced exactly a year ago at KubeCon. Um, it's close to beta. Uh, real soon now, we should be releasing a, a fairly stable beta. Um, we're gonna focus on performance, security, scalability, and so on, and have a 1.0 around the middle of next year. Uh, Workflows is a relatively early project. Um, it should have a beta mid to late next year. Um, yeah, and security, scalability, and performance are, are the uh, focuses of, of the project for, for the next few months at least. Uh, for more on the roadmap and everything else, uh, check out fission.io and GitHub, um, and talk to us on Slack or Twitter. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. Anyone? Hey, thanks. Uh, some way to switch this on. Yeah, it's uh, hi. Hi. Can you explain how um, imports, uh, like requirements, are, are baked into a function? Yes. So I can open up an example. Um, essentially, the, the declarative build system that I showed you, that's, the builder is the one that can do imports and requirements uh, gathering as well. So you can provide a build script with a function, or you can use the built-in one in the environment. And when, whenever the function is built, it uses, um, actually, let me just use my editor. Let's go. Uh, it, it uses that, sorry. So the stuff I demoed is, uh, it's actually in a pull request. Uh, but you can have I'm having a hard time finding it, but um, let me tweet out that link later uh, to actually show you how that works. Um, but essentially, you can have a, a spec of requirements using whatever is idiomatic in the language. So if it's Python, there's a requirements.txt. If it's Go, there's a, uh, either a Glide file or, or the various other dependency tools. Uh, and you can write a script that, that runs those. Uh, and Fission then packages it and is in charge of transporting that package to the function when it's supposed to run. What kind of message queue do you guys have? 
Uh, we do not inst we do not um, deeply integrate with any message queue. Um, the 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 picture I showed you earlier of triggers, that's how we integrate with any message queue. So there's a NAT uh, message queue uh, trigger, there's a Kafka trigger, um, that's, that's super early right now. And uh, folks from Microsoft have contributed an, an Azure storage queue trigger as well. Um, so that's it for message queues. Uh, the workflow engine uses NAT streaming, which is a durable version of NAT. Um, yes? Where are you storing the build output? Yes. So. Uh, so Kubernetes custom resources have a size limit, obviously. Um, so Fission actually installs a, what we call a storage service. It's a really thin wrapper on top of either persistent volumes, or it can also be configured to use uh, things like S3. And you fetch that uh, when you Run the specialize point. the yes, container? Yes, exactly, right. Okay. Uh, so the custom resource points to that, uh, points to that object and verifies the integrity and so on. So, uh, if I were to, if I were to run something like npm dependencies through the builder, yes. you would fetch the entire node modules down when you were doing specialization of the container. No, no, no. Well, so the build um, process is separate from the running process. Right. So, but, but if we, you are storing that in S3, uh, yes, if when we you fetch specialize that the container, yes. you'd have to yes. fetch the whole node module. Right. Thanks. There's some work going on on prefetching uh, that that would affect. Um, the cold start times, especially if these uh, dependencies get really large. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, could I write a uh, pod initializer in Fission? And if so, how would I do that? Yeah. Um, you're talking about the new Kubernetes initializers feature? Right. Yeah. Um, today, right now, you'd have to create a, the, the best way to do it would be to create a trigger for, uh, for, pod, for Kubernetes initializers. And, uh, and then declare you. You need a new type that says this is an initializer, and uh, the implementation, the fission implementation of that would watch the initial. Would be a, a custom controller that watches that, um, and executes a certain function when that, uh, uh, whenever the the API call specified in the initializer actually occurs. So this isn't implemented yet in fission, uh, but we want to have a way for you to do this without having to do all the work of writing the controller. Um, we do have Kubernetes watches, so you can watch an arbitrary set of resources after they're created, so it's a, quite different from the initializer. Uh, but if you're trying to do custom behavior on top of Kubernetes, uh, that fits some of the use cases. So uh, you, you could use Fission to create like a, a controller that watches for CRDs, for example? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anyone? All right, thank you very much.